So welcome everybody. Uh, buenas tardes and thank you very much for joining us um, in our event today on community archiving. Uh, my name is Alejandra Lenes and I'm uh, the primary investigator of the Democratizing Racial Justice and the chair of the Department of Race, Ethnicity and Gender Studies here at UTSA. So I'm gonna introduce our project. Uh, so the Demo Democratizing Racial Justice Project funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation was envisioned by Dr. Jackie Cuevas with Dr. Rhonda Gonzalez and myself. It is a collaborative project among UTSA's Women's Studies Institute, the Department of Race, Ethnicity, Gender and Sexuality Studies at UTSA, the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center, Alamo Community Colleges, the Mexican American Civil Rights Institute, the Institute of Texan C Cultures. And the purpose is to engage in community-based endeavor endeavors to envision and realize racial justice. Through site-based collaborations, democratizing racial justice elevates co-created community knowledge for just societies, transform access to the academy for people of color and first-generation students, and propagates transformative pedagogies in ethnic studies and the humanities. Democratizing racial justice, building on an established network of partners brings together activist scholars, students, and community members to formulate community-centric ethical collaborations where people of color remember histories, responds to community needs, conducts collective research, and imagine thriving futures where racial justice is possible. Democratizing Racial justice seeks to transform the role of higher education, ethnic studies, and the humanities in particular has in combating the racial people of color and their histories and in reimagining societies in which people are equally valued. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, I want to go over some community guidelines. So, Viviana, if you could put them. Um, yeah, thank you so much. So, uh, we have some logistic agreements and some community agreements. So please mute yourself when not speaking. Please use the hand raising icon when one, you want to ask questions. Please share your preferred name and pronouns and, and hold your questions for the end of the session. And as far as our community agreements, speak from your own personal experiences using I statements, listen respectfully without interrupting, Respect Black, Indigenous, people of color, respect all gender identities and expression, and commit to dialogue rather than debate. So it is my honor to introduce uh, our speaker today, um, Dr. Sara Sanaida Gold. She is the Executive Director of the Mexican American Civil Rights Institute, a national organization collecting and disseminating Mexican American civil rights history. A long, a long time public historian, she has curated over a dozen exhibits on history, art and culture, and was formerly founding director of the Museo del West Side and lead curatorial researcher at the Institute of Texan Cultures. She received a BA in American Studies from Smith College, an MA and PhD in American Culture from the University of Michigan. She's a former fellow at the National Museum of American History, the Winter her museum in the American Antiquarian Society. Uh, now I will, I'm gonna turn it also to my co-primary investigator, Dr. Kirsten Garden, Gardner, who's also an associate professor of history, who's also gonna introduce the four part series of, the, of our community archive event. Thank you all for joining us today. It's great to see so many of you here. And this is the first of four series that we'll be doing on Community Archives with Dr. Sarah Gould. We're thrilled with this collaboration between Macri and the Democratizing Racial Justice Pro Project. And we encourage you to mark your calendars for the next three events. Today will be an introduction to Community Archives. And in the next three sessions that follow up on this series, we'll be looking at ways to identify a specific project, and that can be anything from an individual to a family to community history. Then in the third series, we'll think about the details that you want to consider if you embark on this project. And then finally, we'll present some ideas about thinking about the future. 
So I really look forward to this opening session. Dr. Gould, we're really happy to have you here. And I'll turn things back to Dr. Elena. Thank you so much. And I hope to see everybody in our next series. So um, Sarah, thank you very much for joining us today. So as we illustrated in your introduction, you have such a great working knowledge of public history in, in San Antonio. So I hope we can begin this conversation very broadly. So in recent decades, the term community archives can become increasingly popular. Can you tell us a little bit more about this term, its definition, and its history? Why is this so important to San Antonio today? Okay, well, thank you uh, for having me uh, join you today. It's good to see you. And I was just looking at the participant list and I recognize um, a bunch of, of friends and colleagues. Um, so um, thank you so much for um, having me here. And I, I know a lot of you have experience in archives and community projects. So I hope you'll have some good questions and comments at the end. Um, I do just want to say um, A, I'm not a certified archivist. I do not have an MLIS. Uh, my background is really more um, interdisciplinary history, public public history, but I have a long history of being involved in some degree or another in archives or just thinking about archives. So actually, as I was preparing for today, I was thinking that 19 years ago, I was a uh, first semester grad student. And um, as part of my coursework that first semester, I took this class called Archival Principles and Practices, which was cross-listed with the School of Information and the History Department. And uh, my final paper for that class, which I probably would have been writing about this time of year, uh, was on the need to diversify archival collecting practices. And while I'm sure that my first semester grad school paper was really not that great, um, it's just kind of amazing to me that uh, all these years later, that topic is still very much guiding my work. Um, so when we think about community archives, as opposed to the archives that I, I was primarily studying at that moment and that um, as an undergrad, I was an intern in a couple of large institutional archives at the Smithsonian. Um, but what we're talking about with community archives is archives that are created by community groups to document history that is important to them and that may or may not have any connection to larger institutional archives, the kinds of archives that are generally associated with either government bodies or universities. Um, and that community archives are often inspired by something unique or significant that has occurred within a community. And the fact that it doesn't feel like, or it doesn't seem like that history is being captured anywhere else. And so uh, communities take it upon themselves to figure out, okay, well, how can we start doing this ourselves? And sometimes there is engagement with larger institutional archives, but not necessarily. Um, in terms of when do we see these coming up? You, you asked about uh, the history of this um, concept. And I really think that there is a big connection between community archives and kind of the, what's called the social turn in history. So think about late 60s, early 70s, you start getting this uh, emergence of not only um, historians who are thinking about what they're calling social history, but you also get this huge surge of interest in things like women's history, uh, ethnic history, labor history, right? There's this big resurgence, very much inspired and fueled by the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement, things like that, um, just a, a global liberation movement that is happening. Um, and so simultaneous to in universities, these women's studies departments and these labor history uh, scholars um, and ethnic studies departments starting to pop up. We also see in the community, a big movement to create community museums. This is especially true in the mid seventies, late seventies. Um, we see this huge, uh, proportionately compared to, to before, 
this uh, number of African American community museums. Um, that's when we start to see just the first little inklings of like Asian museums and uh, Asian American museums, uh, Latino museums. A lot of those community museums don't last. A few of them do, um, but um, but there's this this um, strong interest and in telling from communities to tell their own stories. And so I very much connect the community archive emergence to the emergence of the social turn, the emergence of community museums, the emergence of women's history, ethnic studies, um, that sort of thing. Um, the other thing that, that pops up during that period is a renewed interest in oral history. So oral histories kind of got on the map here during the Great Depression when the WPA started doing a lot of uh, oral history collecting. Those, um, as you probably know, ended up in the biggest of the institutional archives, the Library of Congress. But um, in the 70s, we start seeing all these people doing these little, you know, homespun oral history projects. Um, and in fact, what we see in community archives is that those oral histories become one of the kind of core methodologies to create collections in community archives. So they're all kind of connected. In terms of thinking about San Antonio, San Antonio is a, a place that I, I think everybody knows. It's a very old city. It's a city with very rich, complicated history. Um, that it's a city that has lived under multiple national flags. Um, and it's a city that um, has gone through kind of like boom and bust periods. I mean, a lot of cities have gone through that, but if you think about San Antonio as having at one point been the center of Spanish Texas, then the center of Mexican, Spanish, uh, of Mexican Texas, and then, um, and then kind of goes through a period of um, a major transition to, oh, now it's not this big city in Texas because now that's, that's Houston or that's Dallas um, and that kind of changing identity. Um, and I think um, unfortunately part of, of maybe that kind of sense of, um, I don't know, that sense of, of almost being a second city to Houston or Dallas has meant that we haven't always paid as much attention to our history. Um, I, I, not to say community at the community level. I think at the community level, San Antonians love to talk about San Antonio history. But do we see that history told in national spaces? Do we see how how is San Antonio represented at the Bullock Museum in Austin? Right. Um, so San Antonio is underrepresented in many ways, despite its quite quite large influence on the state and on the country. Um, so I think community archives are doing that work that um, that community archives first emerged to do, and that's to capture that history of the the local and the undertold. So there's a lot of opportunity here in San Antonio for that. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. So you already addressed uh, somewhat um, the next. A uh, question we have, but maybe you want to elaborate a little bit more. And how do community archives differ from traditional archives, those located in universities or government-sponsored libraries? Mm -hmm. So um, community archives don't necessarily play by the same um, rules as institutional archives, meaning that um, Institutional archives, for a variety of reasons, tend to have rather strict rules about collecting, about access, about um, the whole process of um, from, from the point of acquisition to the point that it becomes part of the permanent collection to the point that it becomes available for people to request access to. Um, th there's a whole... Uh, carefully designed process. Sometimes that carefully designed process serves as a real barrier to people feeling like I can go there and I can see these things or um, uh, I can get the answers that I'm looking for there because maybe they in fact haven't collected anything relevant to the answers that you're looking for. So with community archives, 
um, community archives have the opportunity to essentially rewrite those practices to best meet the needs of the community that they have organized to, to document. So for example, one of the things that we're seeing a lot in community archives is thinking about how do we change um, how do we change access guidelines? And can we adopt shared authority models? So that would mean that, um, for example, if the art, this community archive was to accept um, some, some thing, uh, actually you see this a lot in like, for example, in indigenous uh, community archives, they might take some object in that is used for a particular ceremony uh, it gets cared for, it gets um, uh, documented and protected in that archive. But then when this annual ceremony comes around, they hand it back to the community so they can use it. Um, and so that, that would be just an example of shared authority that um, the archive in and of itself does not have 100% ownership of something, rather they're the, the caretaker, but the community gets to use that thing when it, uh, uh, based on whatever kind of agreement they've come up with with the archive. So um, that's just one example. And, and it's true that some institutional archives have been looking at, is it possible for us to, to adopt shared authority? But I think they've just been a little bit slower to adopt that. And um, that's okay. I mean, they'll, they'll get there maybe, but I think that one of the things that really sets community archives apart is that from the get-go, community archives tend to be thinking about things like that. Uh, who really owns this? Um, I think that one of the things that, that we really have to acknowledge, for example, with, with the, the example that I gave you uh, for that um, indigenous object, um, we really have to think about ways in which knowledge is communal, right? Um, if knowledge is communal, if knowledge is something that all of us contribute to in different ways, then how do we make sure that the people who are involved in the, in the creation of knowledge actually get access to that later on? Um, so if, if the idea is that something is going to go into an archive and it's going to be there you know, for the next few hundred years, um, will the descendants of the people who created that be able to access it easily and, and free from intimidation? Because I think that that's one of the the big barriers that you hear about is people in the community have no idea how to go about approaching a university archive for access to something. They don't, you know, A, they don't necessarily know if the archive has what they're looking for, but if they hear that yes, or they find out some way that yes, they do have this thing you're interested in, it can be very intimidating to figure out, okay, well, how do I even get permission to go there? And then once I get there, do I know the right things to do? Um, and so we do need to just sort of think about that. And I wanted to just tell you one little story. Um, when I was doing my doctoral dissertation research, I um, scheduled a couple of days to go to this archive at Princeton University. And so on the first day that I was supposed to be there, I showed up, went up to this desk and said, you know, I'm here for my appointment, whatever. I give her my ID, which is very standard practice, right? They wanna keep track of who's going in and out of places with rare things, right? Give her my ID. I think everything's fine. And she's like, okay, you just need to go through that door and wash your hands, which I wasn't very familiar with that, but okay. I opened this door. It was a janitor's closet. It was full of mops and things like that. And then a sink. And I looked back at her and I was like, you know, wanting to make sure that I opened the right door. And she nodded at me, you know, so I go in this janitor's closet and I wash my hands and I come back out and then she says, okay, now you can go through these double doors, which was actually to go into the archive, right? Since then, I've met different people who've done research at that archive and I've always asked them, did you have to go in that janitor's closet and wash your hands? And to date, I have not met anybody else who had to do that. And I'm not saying I'm the only one who's ever had to do it, but so far I have not met anybody else who had to do that. Um, and so, you know, things like that, kind of turn you off from going to an archive. Um, so when we think about um, community archives, I really think community archives are in many ways the, the opposite of that. We want people to understand that archives at, at the bare minimum 
should represent our collective history and that they should be accessible and welcoming to us. Um, and sure, you wanna have various measures to protect and maintain the collections, but ultimately, what is the point of saving things if no one's allowed to access them, right? Um, you, you, just this idea of these kind of unreasonable barriers to access, um, you just sort of wonder how do some places stay in business like when that when you when you can't really get access to what they have. So um, I think that with with the community archive, the idea is to be a place created by the community for the community, providing easy access, um, providing opportunities for there to be um, shared authority models in place um, to to basically to recreate the whole concept of archive. Yeah, we want to save things, but but we want to. But again, who are we saving them for? Right, that's the question. Who are we saving them for? Thank you so much. That was a really wonderful answer, and I think a lot of us who have done um, archival research, we even as academics, right? Sometimes there is a process of uh, intimidation, difficulty, it's expensive, because it usually requires travel. And if you don't have the proper credentials, can you really access that, mm -hmm. that information that, that you want? And do you have enough time to be able to access everything that you want to access? Because usually we are working with very limited funding, when especially when it requires uh, some type of travel. And uh, it would be really interesting to continue to do research as into who's been asked to wash their hands, right? <laughs> yeah, I, that is really, it's, it is disturbing, right? Um, let's move on to our, um, so I think you, again, you already addressed this a little bit, but maybe we can go deeper. So how does directing attention to community archives allows us to rethink the historical process? Mm -hmm. When we think about community archives and the way that um, they're generally set up uh, to capture those stories that the, whoever the organizers of the community archive are, they're going to go after the stories that they think are the important ones, right? So that really redefines who, who makes history, whose history is worthy of documenting and saving, who's, who gets to tell the stories, who gets to be centered in history. Um, and I personally just think this is incredibly exciting, right? To me, the idea that we have the opportunity, for example, you know, I'll make it a local story. We have the opportunity to rethink the meaning of the Alamo. I think that's incredibly exciting. Um, you know, think about how can we capture stories of descendants of people um, that might give us different perspectives. Um, I hope that people see this idea of rethinking historical processes as exciting. I do know that sometimes um, it's human nature, we get attached to certain things. And so then when somebody offers a different narrative, maybe we feel a little bit threatened or, um, or, or just sort of feel like, wait, no, that can't be because I already know this, this version of the story. Um, but I think that um, what I hope is that um, we can all start to understand that this is nothing to be threatened about, that just because you learned a story one way doesn't mean that other interpretations aren't equally valid. Um, and that in fact, when we know different perspectives on something, it, I think, just makes that history far more interesting. Um, but, um, but definitely this, this idea of recentering uh, whose stories get, get told, um, whose stories get saved and documented and passed down, and, um, and who is involved in, in both capturing those stories and in telling those stories. But I think what, what we're seeing with the community archives is expanding who's being asked, who gets to share, and then 
making sure that those versions do get, those versions of the story do get documented and saved. I'm sure that a hundred years ago, there were just as many perspectives on something like that as there are now, but were they captured at that time? Were they saved at that time? So this is an opportunity to, um, to do that work. It's beautiful, wonderful. Um, so when you think about community archiving, what models come to mind? You know, I, I mentioned before the, the WPA, um, I think that if, even though the WPA was, came out of a government project um, and, 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 and all of that stuff is now housed at the Library of Congress, I, I think of that as kind of an early model of um, what community archives can do in that they were sending people out to communities. Those people that they sent out weren't necessarily all, you know, history professors. Um, but um, I'm thinking about both the, the oral history project that the WPA did and even the photography, right? But just this idea of sending people out to communities to um, talk to them, to get to know them, and then to record their lives and their memories, and then uh, put that in a repository where it could be shared for other people for generations to come. So that's kind of you know, a, a very old model, again, didn't come out of the community, but did come out of a, um, a need for, for jobs uh, from the community. Um, but I think that, that that model kind of foreshadowed um, some of the ways that we are documenting alternative histories today. And so, um, uh, and, and also it kind of foreshadowed the ways that we're starting to see the government interested in um, community archives. So we have organizations like IMLS and the National Endowment for Humanities now funding some community archives demonstrating a, a, um, a recognized value in the work that communities are doing, right? Um, I definitely think of uh, tribal museums, um, tribal museums and archives as also doing a lot of the kind of groundwork lane that others of us are drawing upon. Um, this idea that so many of the indigenous um, communities who uh, worked to create their own museums and archives understood that the knowledge that they're putting in there doesn't just belong to that entity, but rather it belongs to the whole community um, that created that knowledge. I think that's something we all need to learn from. Um, locally, I think SACAM, the San Antonio African American Museum, um, and uh, I'm sorry, Community Archive and Museum is a model um, that we can all look to and that was born right here in our backyard. They actively host these, uh, I think they call them history harvest days, where they have um, opportunities for people to record oral histories, to have photographs and uh, mementos scanned, and then they, they go into an archive that they're building. So um, that's a, a great local example. Um, nationally, there's this fantastic, one of my, my favorite examples is uh, the South Asian American Digital Archive, uh, which for a number of years now has been collecting South Asian history and putting it onto this uh, great website. And so they've got photographs, oral histories, um, news clippings, all kinds of things on there. Um, and then for, um, you know, something that I, I think of as um, kind of fun for like um, um, undergrads or even high school students, is something uh, as basic as the website History Pen, which um, I don't, I know there are fancier things out there now, but it's so easy to use. It's like, if you, if you can do Pinterest, you can do History Pen. Um, but um, that's just sort of a fun way for uh, younger people or, or school projects to sort of tap into that idea of um, little bitty community archives. Um, but there, there's so many uh, neat models out there um, and, and more all the time. Thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, let me see. 
And uh, so what do you think that made this um, models Northworthy? Well, it, it's, it's very much just about that broad thinking about what is history, broad thinking about who's qualified to tell this history, um, that focus on capturing the undertold, because I, I think that's really where um, so much important work is happening, right? We know, for example, that um, histories of uh, BIPOC is just way undertold in larger national institutional archives. Uh, we know that even, even women's history um, is undertold, rural history is undertold. So um, there are so many opportunities for that. So I think the, the real strength of community archives is going after that undertold um, uh, history. I also love that they focus so much, tend to, tend to focus so much on personal stories because, um, you know, as the old saying goes, the, uh, the personal is uh, uh, political and we, we have so many um, ways to connect individual stories with, you know, when, when you have, for example, if you've done some history harvest type day and you find we've got, you know, two dozen stories coming out of the same community about this experience, well then, you know, where's the book on that? Where's the documentary on that? And it's a way of exposing um, kind of like with a heat map of where is this uh, hot topic that has been under told. So great stuff um, embedded in these personal stories. That whole just broad thinking about who gets to contribute, who gets, who gets to be a part of um, telling the history of a community. I think that's what makes those models noteworthy is it, it's, um, it's the difference between say, we're gonna do an oral history project where we interview um, previous mayors of major cities versus we're going to do a project where we focus in on midwives, right? That's the difference. Yeah, right. And also I'm thinking about how we validate knowledge. So who we consider who is uh, capable of this of constructing and disseminating knowledge. And a lot of times the community voices are not considered into part of that, that knowledge. And then we continue to replicate colonial histories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So let me see, we still have a few, okay. Uh, so for any listeners who are new to this topic, uh, I think you already addressed this, but maybe we can talk a little bit um, about why archiving is important. And that also kind of relates to some of the things that um, you already mentioned something about uh, hearing individual stories, but what those indiv individual stories tells us about a community in the, in the power of a community archive. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, as some of you may have seen it, I think just over the weekend, there was a story that came out of the LA Times about a, a elderly gentleman um, who had been involved in the early days of Telemundo and in his garage, he had all this footage of a, uh, a series about Chicanos that they had made, I think for Telemundo some years ago, and it had just been sitting in his garage and he kept saying, I should do something about that. And eventually he finally did give what he had to, I think it was USC, um, I might be getting that wrong. And they were able to digitize it and save it. So yes, uh, a major institutional archive, but I will also say uh, saving film that's been in a garage for decades is a major undertaking. Um, the, the gist of that story was um, that, Fortunately, just sort of, um, um, they just managed to get that stuff digitized before it probably would have become too deteriorated to do that. And so now they're able to, to see at least parts of that documentary series. I don't think 100% of it was in his collection, but still um, it, it's an important historical artifact now, but it was just something that had been sitting in his garage. And when we think about the numbers of things that are lost all the time because we think, oh, this isn't that important and it gets tossed. And I'm not 
I'm not encouraging anybody to become some kind of hoarder over this, but um, there, there is something to be said about being able to differentiate between, you know, is this receipt important or can it go in the recycling bin? Or, you know, is this, um, is, is this uh, document that I have from some event that I attended um, 20 years ago when we were organizing to uh, save a community school or something, you know, maybe somebody would be interested in knowing about this. Um, maybe there's some place that this can go. Um, when those things get lost, those things that do tell stories about how community has worked to create change, about how communities have stood up for themselves, about how communities have um, worked together to, um, to make a, a better community. Um, you know, we, we kind of lose important information. We lose, in some cases, ideas for how we can uh, continue to work together to create positive change in our communities. And, um, and also sometimes what happens, and something that I think about a lot in my job is that sometimes we forget how important our community has been to the overall fabric of society. And, and that can lead to erasure, right? Where people just think, oh, um, Mexican Americans, those are like uh, farm workers, those are like uh, housekeepers, and yes, uh, but also um, these are people who have um, fought to expand voting rights, who have uh, fought to end segregation, who have fought to uh, increase labor rights, et cetera, et cetera. And so we wanna make sure that we never forget the work that our all of our individual communities have done to make a better world. Thank you so much. I mean, I, I also, I know in some of the further um, workshops, we might get more into this, but how do we think about the materials that, that we have in our homes? A lot of people have um, a lot of documents in their own garage. And when do you, this, how do you, it's a lot of work to go over them and decide what is what we keep, what we don't keep, who do we, where do we send it to, and and even in uncovering um, the stories of our own families, are we also uncovering the stories of our communities? And right. so I hope that we can have a lot more time to get into a lot of those discussions. Let me see, we have time, I think, for one more question. Um, I think you already, uh, this would be a good one to the last question, and then we can open up to a question and answer. Uh, we, you already, again, talked a little bit about it, but you can go a little bit more in depth. Like who defines a topic and scope a community archive collections? Well, a, a, a true community archive most likely has some kind of like advisory group or, or some wh whoever created the archive probably has some little um, group that it came up with, this is our purpose, right? And I will say it is important to think about what is your scope because if, if your community archive is like, well, we're we're just the San Antonio community archive. Therefore we can collect anything and everything San Antonio. Uh, you're gonna have a space problem real fast because there's, there's just so much to say about San Antonio. And, you know, are you talking about a particular time period like just the 1950s or are you talking about from uh, 1721 to the present? Um, are you talking about, um, uh, you know, are, are, are you focusing on a particular community, west side, south side, east side? Um, but if you make it too broad, you're, you're going to find yourself buried in stuff very quickly. So I would recommend that you do think carefully about what your scope is. Um, keep in mind what your own um, capacity is, right? If you're an all volunteer organization, or even maybe you have one or two staff people, um, are, are, and it's just all digital, are you digitizing everything? And it's like 
what they call post custodial, where you only have the digital copy and whoever brought you that those things, they take it back home with them. Or are you in fact taking the physical thing and where are you gonna put it? Um, do you have the proper kind of things to, to store it? Um, a community archive might be able to get away with not following the exact standards of a large institutional archive, but that doesn't mean you just stuff everything into a filing cabinet. Um, so um, having a scope is probably in your best interests. Uh, so maybe your scope is, um, we're focusing on the history of the St. Mary's Strip in the 1990s, you know? and and the the communities of music lovers who came out of the 1990s on the St. Mary's strip you know so maybe that's your scope but just having some kind of scope i think is is going to help you in terms of knowing what to ask the community for like we need help with stories about x um if you have a scope you'll you'll be able to finish that sentence um, if you are um, wanting to create maybe a, a lot of times what happens with community archives is on the user end, there might be the creation of a website or a story map or something like that. And so if you're thinking about, well, how, how are users going to access this? You also need to be thinking about, well, what's going on there? So for example, if you're collecting oral histories and you're planning to put them on a website, well, then maybe you should collect those oral histories using a video camera rather than just an audio recorder so that people can see them. Because if it's gonna be on a website, um, you can, you can uh, uh, compress video and, and make it accessible. You can put it on YouTube, you know? So um, having that idea of what your scope is is definitely going to help determine um, what's possible for your project. And, and so you want to think about what's our capacity, what's our end goal, how do we want users to interact with this? Okay, and then let's just make sure that our scope is in line with those other goals. Thank you very much. So I'm going to open it now to questions so if people can raise their hand. I did get one question um, through the direct chat from a student who had to leave because she had to go to class, Ariana Valdez, and I'm gonna read her question. So this is as a quote, I th says, I think all this is great and that capturing San Antonio history is so important. And it is something I'm currently trying to do in my own research. But recently at a community meeting, I was challenged on focusing my research on Afro-Latinidad in just San Antonio only. I'm also looking at the immigrant experience in African diaspora as it pertains to people who settle here. But how, but how would you respond to this type of critique on focusing on one locality like San Antonio? Thank you. And again, again the name is of the student is Ariana Valdez. Well, everyone has an opinion. Um, um, I mean, I think what you need to do is just determine what is what is your end goal. Um, I can see how, and also, is it, are you just one person working on this, uh, or do you have a team of people? If it's just one person, I probably would go with 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 just narrowing it down just a little bit for now. And then maybe in a year or two, when you feel like you've made good strides with that, maybe you add on um, the, the, the part about the diaspora, or if, if you wanted to start with that, and then I, I don't know, but I, I just, what I don't want to happen is for you to take on so much that you just get frustrated and um, feel like it's not gonna work. Um, so you can always start small and then grow. Thank you. I was having trouble finding my unmute. So I see a hand by, I hope I don't uh, mispronounce uh, this person's name, Abra Schroer. Yeah, sorry, you. I'm not sure how to, <laughs> I, I don't want to butcher your name too much. You're fine. Thank you. Hi, Sarah. Um, I'm going to read out my question. You've made some comments about it, and certainly the students um, uh, question relates to mine as well. Um, 
but obviously I come from the perspective of an institutional archivist, but I'm hoping you can comment on the challenges of balancing the organization, the intake of community archives, and then the access to material. Yeah. So thank you for your comment about the scope um, uh, of your collecting project, but in terms of backlog boxes and boxes of material, the abundance of digital files, how do you set up a community archive not to have those types of typical access challenges that institutional archives have? Yeah. <laughs> That's a million dollar question. Um, so if, for those of you who don't know, Abra is at Trinity University. Um, so a large archive um, with, with more staff than I have, um, maybe not as much staff as she would like, but more staff than I have. Um, so um, I think that there are several things to say here. One, if somebody comes to me and has something that they want to go in, in, to our archive, and, and we haven't really gotten to this yet. I think it might be in a, one of the future parts of this four-part program, um, but, but MACRI is in the process of creating a community archive. So um, you're, you're catching me at the point when we're in the still sort of back-end planning stages. So a lot of these things are in my head because we're trying to make sure we, we do it right, or at least as best as we can. So, um, as people, for example, have been coming to me and saying, I have this thing I want to give to you, even though your archive is still just in the planning stages, um, I have mostly, mostly tried to say, if that thing in fact falls into our collecting scope, which is specifically Mexican American civil rights history, I have mostly tried to say, can you hang on to that for one more year while we work out the whole system and then we'll be able to to take it in because um i am very conscious of how fast you can develop a backlog as abra said um and it probably most archives do have a backlog of unprocessed things um having said that there have been a couple of cases where and, and actually uh, i'm handling one just this week where i found out that some very important things are sitting in a garage right here in san antonio not a good place for those things to be. Um, I'm going to be moving them this week into an air conditioned uh, storage unit. That's not ideal because it's kind of expensive. And I mean, not crazy expensive, but it, it's just a little bit expensive. And, um, but <laughs> the plan is we're actually going to have those things on display within about six months so that it won't be a forever situation. But also I just couldn't, stomach the idea of those things sitting in a garage for this winter, you know, um, so um, especially after what we went through last winter. So <laughs> although who knows what's going to happen, but with the electricity, but um, yeah, I, I know you have to really think about how can we take this stuff uh, in, a, in a way that works with our timeline and with our capacity, because you can end up with a backlog very quickly. I'm very much hoping that part of what we will be doing with our um, community archive is that um, if you just imagine a pie chart, only, I don't know, 15, maybe maximum 20% of that pie chart would actually be stuff that we physically accept. Uh, we are very interested in post custodial collections. So for example, um, there are institutional archives that have been collecting Mexican American civil rights history, have those things in their collections, maybe digitized, maybe not, but we are hoping to work with places like that, either to link to things that they've already digitized or to help underwrite the digitization of, of relevant collections that haven't been digitized yet. And then we, and then we would link them to our, our portal but we would never actually own them. So we're not necessarily interested in owning all of this stuff. Again, I'm very interested in the whole concept of shared authority, as well as um, if you've already got it, great. <laughs> Just let us uh, put the digital copy here. And in other cases for families that have things uh, that have never been digitized or, or shared with the public, if they're interested in doing that, but want to retain them because they're valuable family documents, then we, um, uh, the plan is we would pay to have them digitized 
put the digital copy on the portal, but the family would retain custody of the original items. Um, and again, if you just imagine a pie chart, I don't want us to become the owners of more than say 15 to 20% of what ultimately is in the collection um, because um, I'm, not, I'm not entirely convinced that it needs to belong to us. Like I, I just think that particularly when we're talking about uh, families of color, it's not easy to hold on to family artifacts um, over the years because of um, socioeconomic challenges. And so if you have managed to hang on to something, I would love it if your family can continue to hang on to it. Now, if, if for some reason you just don't want it anymore, well, then we can have that conversation. But um, in a way, I would just rather families be able to hold on to things. Thank you so much. Uh, I see the hand of Anne, Anne Hardgrove. Hi, Sarah. This, this is all absolutely wonderful. I love it. I have a question for you about sort of contention within the community about some of these things. And I've had, I started a project with my students to have them interview UTSA professors who have South Asian heritage. And so one of the things that I encountered, we were, number, we were able to do eight video interviews before COVID came and shut us all down. We were able to do eight wonderful <clears throat> videos, but one thing that I came across was some reluctance among potential subjects to be interviewed in the sense of, and not necessarily like vis-a-vis -vis the UTSA community, but just within the community. So for example, I mean, there's a pretty strong like Hindu nationalist movement right now in India, and people will go and troll like Muslim professors at universities. And so there were a few subjects who decided not to go through with it because they really didn't want to put themselves out there. And so I know you've been talking about access and, um, you know, sharing and all of that. And I guess I've come across the opposite of, of people just who are a little scared um, to put themselves out there. And, you know, another issue and, you know, the interviews were focused on, you know, their professional work at, at UTSA, but some people wanted to focus about family stuff. And there were just different levels of confidence in um, who might access these things and and people not wanting to set themselves up, you know, um, to be harassed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a major issue in, in oral histories with living subjects, right? Um, so um, I think sort of the classic case was from some years ago with members of the IRA uh, at, uh, was at Boston College. Um, and um, so, so, yeah, I mean, one of the things with archives um, is that some of what goes into archives is related to the lives of people who have passed away. And so at that point, you can kind of you can certainly hope there won't be any blowback to a family that contributes some, you know, maybe letter between their grandfather and somebody talking about uh, a lynching or that they, they bore witness to or something like that, right? Um, but when you're talking about living subjects, you absolutely have to be sensitive to uh, what, what might impact them. And so honestly, um, this is a little tricky because um, you have to ensure that there will be somebody there to, to be watchful of this. But with oral histories, one option is to say that this will not become public until 30 years from this date. Um, it's a little tricky again, because somebody has to be responsible for keeping track of that, right? And, and which is why I also say 30 years from this date versus after you die, because is somebody really mm -hmm. gonna be watching the, the obituaries for that? So I, I think it's much better to just put a, a firm 30, 40 years. But again, you still have to have somebody watching that. Um, having said that, um, there are also sometimes options with oral histories where you do part one of the oral history is the part that asks the questions that will be public. And part two is the one that gets um, kind of with a, a, a date attached to it for release. Um, I, I recall actually doing something similar to that with a professor who has now passed away, but at the time, uh, part one was about um, 
professional career, part two was about a sexual harassment lawsuit. Um, and she wanted that um, to not be public until after some number of years. So um, there are ways to get around that. I, I kind of feel like for students, that's an awful lot for them to have to navigate. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that is just the tricky thing about living subjects. Thank you so much. So I see the next hand, uh, Catherine Nolan. Um, Carol, yeah. Carol, I uh -huh. can't see the uh, last part of your name, sorry. No, 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 that's fine. Um, so this is actually kind of similar to, uh, to Anne's question. Uh, several years ago, several of my students had become very involved in the DACA movement. And uh, at the tail end of a lot of that activism, a couple of them wanted to form a community archive. Um, and then they were like, oh, well, maybe, and you remember Agnes, she said, well, maybe we should work with Agnes and maybe she can help us. Um, and one of the challenges that we found, and I think it was a fair one, um, but as soon as UTSA got involved, the people who had started to um, share the information with us said, well, if UTSA is gonna be involved, we want them to give three scholarships per year to undocumented students. Oh. And there was no way I could <laughs> guarantee something like that. But I mean, I, I, I see their point, right? It shouldn't just be quote unquote taken. Um, but that's been, I, I've, I've stayed in touch with this student and periodically she'll, she'll send me an email and she said, any idea yet if UTSA is gonna give that money over for the students because she really, she's in a PhD program now in history and she really sees the value in documenting. And, and I asked our students uh, in my, one of my classes the other day, how many people knew that UTSA actually had a pretty active DACA movement and they boycotted um, mm -hmm. uh, Kate Bailey Hutchinson and nobody had ever heard of it. Oh. Which was that part of the silencing, right? Mm -hmm. And so I would love just insight on what do you think maybe Macri would be a great place for something like this? You know, I I I was um, in San Antonio when that happened. I I remember that, um, and uh, that's unfortunate that students at UTSA don't know that now because it was amazing to see UTSA students take that uh, that risk um, because they they were standing up for you know. All, all of their, um, their, their, not just their generation, but I, I also felt that they were standing up for the choices that their parents made, right? Because um, I, I know that so often um, the parents of DACA students get, um, I don't know, accused of being bad parents or something and just could not be further from the truth. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, obviously that's really complicated and I want to, you know, Rules have changed a little bit over the last few years. Um, 10 years ago, uh, if you were at a university, you had to go through IRB to do an oral history project. You don't anymore. And on the one hand, that has freed things up. On the other hand, now maybe it's a little harder to get guidance on how do I navigate um, little tricky things like this. Um, of course, the Oral History Association does have some guidelines on their website. Um, in terms of the situation with the scholarships though, the money, I don't, I don't know how you or honestly anybody <laughs> could force the university to do something like that. Um, although I certainly a very kind sentiment. Um, I do recall, because uh, I, I ran into an, an issue with, with a, a, a DACA um, recipient who I had done an oral history with in her, her oral history, she kept talking about the whole process. And, um, and I was a little concerned about if we put this out there, am I outing her, right? Um, but um, I actually consulted with uh, uh, um, a, a lawyer on that and it was like, well, this person has gone on the news and talked about being a DACA recipient. And this person is already already out as a DACA person. So um, I didn't, they did not feel that I needed to, to have that concern, but I, 
I certainly, you know, didn't want to ever feel like I might have exposed her to something, right? But um, uh, I even talked to her about it, and she was like, "No, no, you know, this, this is, this is what I, what I do. This is who I am." I'm, and she was not hiding it. Um, but um, yeah, that's so tricky. Um, I'd be happy to talk to you to see if that's something that maybe Makri could could um, help you with in terms of finding a home for them. Um, we can't provide scholarships either at this point, but I do love that idea. Um, and, um, but he, I, gosh, and I, I will just say though, I think that a lot of institutional archives, whether we're talking about UTSA or some other, uh, for a variety of reasons, a lot of community members just don't necessarily trust large institutions. Over the years, a lot of uh, people of color, um, LGBTQ people, um, have been burned by these larger institutions for some way or another. And so it's um, understandable that maybe sometimes people are a little suspicious or, or think that there might be some other motives. I tend to think that archivists are some of the best people, but I think that's just because I spent a lot of time in archives. But um, yes, what Abra said, moving at the speed of trust. Um, and um, so, I mean, I'd, I'd be happy to chat with you offline about that. Um, this is just a challenge that we face, right? And um, one of the one of the um, strengths that community archives often have is that because they tend to be created by people within a community, they already have those connections to people in communities, those relationships. And so hopefully there's already that trust. Um, and for larger institutions, it sometimes just takes a little bit more work to build those relationships. Um, and then of course the problem with, with larger institutions is that you get turnover. So that person that the community built a relationship with might leave or retire or whatever. Um, and so then it's up to the next person to rebuild all of those relationships. So um, it, it, it's a lot of work. Well, Sarah, thank you very much. Uh, it is a little bit after two, and I, for everybody, a lot, a lot of people have been reading the chat, but it seems like we're getting a lot of really good feedback. Um, like many people starting their conversation, that has been a wonderful conversation. So, and that they plan to come to the other workshops. So, uh, yeah, this has been really very helpful um, for a lot of us and. I want to thank you very much for this wonderful, wonderful conversation. And I want to thank everybody who participated today. And I do want to take a little bit of time to recognize the DRJ staff that worked um, very hard to get this uh, workshop together, uh, particularly Jasmine Podina, Viviana Guillén, um, uh, Jose Villagran, uh, Carolina Arango, our faculty fellows, Jerry Gonzalez and Sonia Leman, and of course, uh, Kirsten Gardner, uh, who uh, we work very closely. And Sarah has been uh, such a pleasure to work with you. Again, been really amazing to all the conversations that we've had and how we were able to put this together. And that's what I'm looking forward for the next three years. And I think a lot of us have a lot of questions on community archives in our own family histories. And uh, so I hope, you know, we'll continue to have, continue these conversations and recognize that knowing our histories and documenting our histories is a very important part of democratizing racial justice because we are democratizing knowledge and we are recognizing that not just the knowledge that's come from our communities, but how we have, uh, fought to be able to have just more just societies. And so again, thank you so much. Thank you. And so don't forget, we'll be here next Monday, um, one o'clock. Uh, so please let people know, uh, your friends, family, anybody who might be interested, we'll continue to send more information and, um, and we'll, um, so please, yeah, we'll see you next Monday. Thank you so much.